So as the last folks are coming in, I'll go ahead and get started and introduce myself. Um, uh, I'll keep it brief, but I think my background is pretty relevant here. And it even says it in the title. So my name is Cornelia Davis. I work for Pivotal. Um, I came to Pivotal from EMC. So as you know, Pivotal is a spinoff from EMC and VMware. I uh, worked in the corporate CTO office at EMC for about seven years. Um, essentially doing emerging tech, and I spent a lot of time doing RESTful web services and service-oriented architectures and all of that stuff. Worked with a lot of product groups across EMC, and about six months before the Pivotal spinoff, my boss, Tom McGuire, said to me, hey, you know, I want you to start looking at this new PaaS thing. And I said, oh, great. Um, always want to learn something new, and let's take a look at Cloud Foundry. It's VMware after all, so that was, you know, part of EMC, if you will. And so I started uh, learning about Cloud Foundry, and um, I st actually first did some research, and I started reading about this platform as a service thing. And everything I read said platform as a service is for the developer. It was all about developer agility, making the developer's lives easier, and all of that stuff. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. This is all about me. It's all about my life. And so... Um, I started working with Cloud Foundry, and I started working with another group within EMC, actually with Gary Frankel's group, um, the content management group. And uh, we started playing with Cloud Foundry together with, with Documentum, with content management. Learned about Cloud Foundry. We had the Pivotal spinoff, and I was working in another project for a while, and then I joined the Cloud Foundry team. So it's been about two and a half years, more than two and a half years that I've been playing with Cloud Foundry. About two years ago, I was joining the Cloud Foundry group, and I joined in a role. I'm the director of platform engineering there. I joined in this platform engineering role, and platform engineers are we're in the product team, so we're engineers. We all cut code, but we're field facing in more of a post-sales capacity, but maybe sometimes pre-sales, it really doesn't matter. It's not whether it's pre-sales or post-sales, but we go deep with customers and with partners. So I started going out and I started talking to customers and um, learning about what their, their challenges were. And I was talking to them about developer experience and platform as a service and developer agility and all of that stuff. And in the back of my mind, I was always thinking, really? They're projecting this huge market size for this product, for, for, for this area, platform as a service. Really, are people going to drop that kind of cash just making my life easier? I, I, it just didn't kind of compute for me. Well, I spent about a month out there talking with all of you, talking with the customers, and I realized that operations was really the, the hard part. And that operations, that the platform, in fact, had a tremendous amount of value from an operational perspective. So I, after 25 years being in development, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm working on an operations product. So that said, I'm still 25 years in development. And earlier this year, in from like the mid-January to the mid-February time frame, I spent a month doing ops. I signed up for it. I reached out to Tony Hansman, our cloud ops, the guy who runs our cloud ops group, and I said, Report, reporting for duty, sir. I'd really like to spend some time doing operations. And it's as a result of that, that I, um, that I propose this topic here at, um, at CF Summit. So I'm going to spend the next, now, 25 minutes or so telling you about that month. I'm going to tell you about how our operations team works, the tools that we use, the, process of the processes that we have in place, and really, in fact, the agenda. And it's not an agenda. I'm not a big fan of agenda slides. But really, these are the goals and talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the principles that we have when we do operations and here at Cloud Foundry. I'm going to tell you a little bit about deployments and about how we, how the, the, the system's deployed, the practices that we use, and so on. Monitoring, of course, is hugely key, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we use for our monitoring, keeping up to speed on that. And throughout all of that, which is going to be a little bit more, hey, let me tell you about how we do things, I'm going to share with you a handful of stories. Because I think in the stories is where we really have these aha moments, these real, like, oh my gosh, real big insights. 
And of course, we're going to talk about the platform as it is. So first of all, what is it that we're operating? So what I'm going to tell you about here today and what I spent one month being on the operations team for is our Pivotal Web Services. So Pivotal Web Services is what you find at run.pivotal.io. How many people have, here have a Pivotal Web Services account? OK, a handful of you. So go to run.pivotal.io. You can get a free account. You can start pushing applications. And you can start doing all that developer stuff. What I worked on was the team that keeps PWS, PDubs, as we refer to it, we keep it up and running. 24-7, zero downtime. And that's the team that I'm working on. So first, let me tell you about what that deployment looks like. So let me give you the deployment topology. And I'm going to start from the left, and I'm going to start from the perspective of how did we stand this thing up, and what components do we use to stand up other components within the system? So it all starts with a jump box. A jump box, in this case, I'll tell you is that we run, run.pivotal.io is running on Amazon Web Services. So as you know, Cloud Foundry runs over a number of different IaaS layers. They'll, we do um, Amazon Web Services. We do vSphere, vCloud Air. We do OpenStack. We have experimental support for other infrastructures as a service. And of course, Microsoft just announced that they're going to provide support for Azure. So it's really great. In this particular case, we're on AWS. We start with a jump box. The jump box is a virtual machine that we've provisioned through the AWS console. And that jump box is going to give us access to the other boxes in the entire system. We can use that to lock down access to some of those other boxes. And we, of course, allow just SSH access into the jump box. Using keys, we manage all the keys. So every individual in the operations organization has their own keys. Those keys have been registered with the jump box. So I can SSH into the jump box and then run the rest of Cloud Foundry. So I'm going to use the Bosch CLI then to access MicroBosch. So MicroBosch is all of Bosch in a single virtual machine. And that virtual machine has the ability for me to deploy other clusters. How many people here are familiar with Bosch? OK, good, good, about half of you. So Bosch is the subsystem of Cloud Foundry that you can use to manage the elastic runtime, which is where you deploy your apps, to manage all of your other clusters, like your RabbitMQ cluster, your MySQL cluster, your homegrown time series database cluster, all of those things. So it's the thing that manages virtual machines. So that's what MicroBosch is that system and all in one single virtual machine. Now you'll notice that the MicroBosch is connected to RDS. That's where we have our, that's what we use for our database for persistence and it's connected to S3 as well. So we're externalizing those two databases, RDS and S3, and we allow RDS and S3, the resilience that's baked into those and the SLAs that are baked into those, we leverage that here in this deployment. That's something you need to think about when you're deploying and running your Cloud Foundry instance, whether it's on-prem or in some cloud offering. So you need to think about having resilient storage. Now MicroBosch, then, in the case of AWS, we use MicroBosch to deploy what we call full Bosch. So that Bosch system that I'm talking about is a very sophisticated system that has many different components. It has a director. It has a health monitor. It has a message bus. It has all of those different components. In MicroBosch, they're all running as processes on a single virtual machine. But you can deploy Bosch running across a cluster of virtual machines. You can do that for scale, for resilience, all of those things. Well, it turns out that Bosch can be used to deploy Bosch, which is really quite cool. So does anybody know what Bosch stands for? It actually stands for Bosch Outer Shell. So Bosch stands for Bosch Outer Shell. That's what we do. We're engineers. We like to do geeky things like self-referential things. That's what we do. So Bosch Outer Shell. So we use it to deploy full Bosch. Now, once full Bosch is deployed, then I can use the Bosch CLI to connect to full Bosch. Now, notice that full Bosch is also connected to an RDS and an S3. 
And finally, I use full Bosch to deploy run.pivotal.io. So right there, Pivotal Web Services, you can see that that's deployed using these Bosch systems on the left-hand side. Whether you're doing it on-prem or you're doing it in the cloud, you will use Bosch to deploy Cloud Foundry. And if you don't, you're insane, because Bosch is so freaking cool that it keeps all these things up and running for you. So if you haven't seen it, look back at a year ago, I did a five-minute uh, lightning talk on the four levels of HA. Two of them come from Bosch, and they're really, really cool. So have a look at that. So again, you'll notice there that that deployment also connects to RDS and S3. And then the other things that we use it, from Amazon that you would use, even if you were doing this on-prem, is you need to do some DNS configuration. We use Route 53 for that. And you're going to have to um, stand up some type of a SSL termination point. So something that's going to handle SSL and feed up certs. What we do is we use elastic load balancers, and those elastic load balancers, we stand up one per domain, one per cert. So you can see that we have one for cfapps.io, run.pivotal.io, et cetera. So we have about a dozen or so different ELBs that are handling different domains for the system. OK? I see a lot of people taking pictures. By all means, keep doing that, but I promise that I will, I will put these things up on SlideShare this afternoon. You can find me at cdavisafc. That's, I use that handle everywhere, Twitter, uh, SlideShare everywhere. OK, so then what are some of the principles? The first thing that I will tell you is that we do deployments during regular working hours. How many people here are in ops that have to do deployment from midnight until 4 in the morning? So when you have Bosch, you don't have to do that anymore. We intentionally do it during regular business hours because Cloud Foundry Bosch has so many safeguards in it that if something goes wrong, you can roll back to a safe state. And we put a lot of processes in place as well, and I'll talk about a few more of those. The other advantage of doing them during regular business hours is that the developers of the system itself are on hand. So that if something goes wrong, we can actually go over to the people who are building the runtime code and say, hey, come take a look at this log with me. And we can get that fixed. So you don't have to be on your own at 2 in the morning doing this deployment all by yourself. That's what DevOps is all about. Let's work together on this. Now, the other thing that I'll tell you is that we categorize our deployments into a number of different types. So we have, for example, a new release. So if you we're going to go from V204 to V205, what that means is that some of the Cloud Foundry components, the health mo manager, the, the cloud controller, the logger gator, some of those are going to get revved. Some or all of those components are going to get revved. That is one type of deploy is when we know that we're revving components. Another type of deploy might happen after something like Heartbleed comes along. We're not going to rev any of the components. We just want to switch out the operating system underneath. And Bosch allows you to do that. So we have a, a deployment type that does that. And then we have something else that's called a manifest only deploy, which means that I'm not changing the OS. I'm not changing any of the components. I'm just changing my topology. I need a bigger cluster, or I need a smaller cluster. So those are manifest-only deploys. Now, I make this distinction to tell you about, to point out two different things. Generally, new releases and stem cell upgrades take a little bit longer. So we start those in the morning. We don't start them at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because those take longer, and we want to get through this during like regular working hours. Manifest-only deploys, where I'm going to add some DEAs, let's say, or I'm going to add some other component or reduce some component, those generally take on the order of minutes. So let me tell you about the first story. So this was great. It happened the very first day that I started on the Cloud Ops team. So I showed up for stand-up, and right after stand-up, we had an incident on run.pivotal.io. So the Sundance Film Festival is one of our customers on run.pivotal.io, run and this was two days before the film festival was going to open. And they were opening up a block of tickets, and they were expecting a, a surge in traffic. So a couple of days before, they had started planning for this. They had scaled out the number of instances on their application. 
in anticipation of this spike in traffic. The spike in traffic came as we expected, and you know what? The app worked flawlessly, no problems whatsoever. However, we had trouble behind the scenes. We were dropping log messages. So we have a loggergator component that aggregates logs. We were dropping log messages because with the added capacity, with the added traffic, we got added log messages. So all of a sudden, we were like, oh gosh, we didn't think about scaling out the loggergators. So what we did was we got on, we did pair ops, my pair, the pair that I was part of, another pair, and somebody from the loggergator team got on a hangout. We started looking at things, and we did a manifest-only deploy. We scaled our loggergators, and let's see if I got the right thing. So you can see here that we have loggergators across two different availability zones. That's what Z1 and Z2 are. And we scaled it from 10 instances per zone to 20 instances per zone. All of that took less than an hour. In less than an hour, we will, were able to respond to an outage like that. Not an outage, but an incident like that, and recover from dropping logs on the ground. And by the way, customer never even knew. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along as well. OK, so that's where we are. The other thing that I'll point out to you is that when we do deployments, those, those new release deployments can take hours. And if you've done a deployment, how many people have done a deployment and watched the compilation take a while? OK, so the, compiling the packages takes a while. We've arranged our pipelines, and I'll show you a picture in just a moment. We've arranged our pipelines so that when we're doing a deploy into production, we are not doing compiles anymore. The packages have been pre-compiled by people that are early on in the process. And in fact, this is the slide here. On the left-hand side, it talks a little bit about how the dependency between the CF runtime and the services, so the runtime team and the services team. But really what's key here is that we have a number of different Cloud Foundry instances that drive our pipeline. So there's some stuff here about how one is for the development, uh, the runtime team, one is for the services team. But the key is right here, that we have a system that is our non-prod system. It's a staging system. And that's where we do deploys before we go to prod, obviously. But here's the kicker. We have a shared package cache so that when we do the deploys on A1, the package compilation happens and gets stored in the shared package cache. So that when we do the deployment into prod, we draw from that shared package cache, and we get to save ourselves all of that time in package compilation. That's a very pragmatic um, uh, technique that you should be using in prod to speed up, or using in, in your environments, to speed up prod deployments. Makes a huge, huge difference. OK. Oh boy, I'm so far behind already. Um, OK, so very quickly, the other thing that I'll mention is that we have checklists for each of those different types of deploys. So when we do a deploy, we go into GitHub. Everything is in GitHub. Checklists are in GitHub. Infrastructure is code in GitHub. Everything's in GitHub. So we have checklists. And in those checklists, we have a number of pre-deployment steps that we do that include things like generating final releases, double checking that I've got the latest out of GitHub and so on. Then I do some deployment steps where I start out logging into the jump box. I pull down from Git again. So I'm using Git across the, thing, across the board. Log into Bosch, upload, upload releases, and all of that stuff. And then I have my post-deployment steps, which are things like publishing the final releases that for some of you who are open source customers are probably leveraging those final releases that you find with the v204, v205, the YAML files. We generate, we publish those final releases, and we update, any, update the checklist with anything that we've learned that maybe we didn't have documented before. All right, so let's talk about monitoring then. So now I've got Pivotal Web Services. It's up and running. So what, are, what am I using for monitoring? How do I know that this thing is still working? And how do I know when something's gone wrong? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, all of the components in Pivotal Web Services in the Elastic Runtime are configured with syslog endpoints. Here's the first trick. 
is that those system syslog endpoints, you don't need to have all of them pointing to the same syslog endpoint or same, same account. So we, in fact, have one account for Logstash where almost everything is going to, probably everything. And then we have another one that the LAM team, the LAM team is the loggergator team, the loggergator log, log um, uh, monitoring metrics, all of that stuff. So we have syslog messages going out to these log loggergator, uh, I'm sorry, to, the, to, to Logstash. On the other side, we have the collector, which is an internal component of Cloud Foundry, and that is sending metrics over to Datadog. We use Datadog. You can use a number of different things. If you've got JMX dashboards, you can use that as well with ops metrics. So that's what we've set up. So then how do we use that? Well, OK, so oh, here, and this is what a dashboard looks like. So we've got the dashboard here, and you can see all sorts of things like DEA status, Diego status, router status, and so on. And the thing that I am here to tell you is if you want this dashboard, you can get it. It's all open source. So a couple of months ago, we open sourced all of the Datadog configurations for Cloud Foundry. So whether you use Datadog or not, you can go take a look at the configuration of this dashboard, and you can take a look at the metrics that we're using to keep everything up and running in operations. OK, so story number two. This one's kind of interesting in that this was on a day where I was on part of a pair we were, where we were updating that dashboard. What was cool about this was that we get to go in. It has a WYSIWYG editor. And we get to, in staging, oh, and just like everything else, this is another principle, is we never do anything directly in prod. We do everything in staging first. So, but we're going to compare what's in staging to what's in prod. So we checked out from something that was in prod. We deployed it to staging, and it broke. And the reason it broke was because there was a bug. Let me tell you where the bug was. In Datadog, Datadog is not really designed for continuous integration. It's not designed with this principle in mind of, hey, I want things to move through a life cycle. I'm going to build my dashboard for staging, and then I'm going to deploy that same dashboard into production. It's not designed for that. We built that on top. So you can see that in that open source repository. We take the dashboard that we create in staging, and then watch this. We do a little transformation, and we deploy it into prod. We had a bug in that transformation. So we, we had to build that ourselves. We had to layer continuous integration on top of Datadog. And we had a bug there, and we fixed it. I just want to contrast that to our platform, the Cloud Foundry platform, and how we have a design for continuous integration. When you're working with Cloud Foundry, we expect you to set up a number of different, st uh, different um, spaces, maybe even Cloud Foundry deployments. And you want to be able to move the same artifact all the way through those different stages. And we take care of the abstractions. The abstractions are here in the event configuration, ENV configuration, and the services abstractions. So we take care of that. So that was a really good little lesson on, um, on, uh, on continuous integration around the ops process. All right, so we have those things in place. How do we use them? Well, Datadog allows you to define alerts, and those alerts are tied to pager duty. Pager duty, of course, is connected to a person, so a person will get paged. And that person then will start to do things like look at the Datadog dashboards and start looking at the, log, the logs that, are, that have been aggregated. So they start doing their troubleshooting. They might send out a, ah, and there's a picture of log, log stash. And I don't have time to go over the details, but this is the tool that they're using to do that troubleshooting. And then they might send something out to a status page. We might, if you get a text message that says something's wrong with PDubs, they might put something out on the status page. And then finally, one thing that's really important is that we have a set of smoke tests that are constantly running in prod. We are constantly, every 10 minutes, we deploy an app. We tie it to services. We scale that app. We access the app, and so on. We have a set of tests that we're constantly running that we make sure are running. And if those tests fail, then that goes into Datadog. And 
into pager duty and somebody responds to it. And then finally, we also use Pingdom to make sure that the console app is up and various apps are up on Pivotal Web Services. So this gives you kind of a landscape. Oh, and by the way, there's one other thing. We also have bots that will put things from the, the uh, alerting mechanism into Slack. So we have Slack bots as well. So this kind of gives you a topology of the entire monitoring system that we use to keep things up and running. Now, what I want to do here for a moment is I want to pause and point out that platform, what we've been talking about so far is platform operations. And you might ask, well, what about application operations? So Pivotal Network runs on run.pivotal.io. The console, the app manager, runs on run.pivotal.io. All of those things are running on run.pivotal.io. Do we, as an ops team, handle that? Actually, we don't. We handle platform operations. So we're the bottom half that keeps Pivotal Web Services up and running. The other teams, the console app team, keeps the application up and running. The PivNet team keeps the application up and running. So we've really broken that out, and that's what the platform enables for you. And when you see the slides, I won't go through it in detail here, but you can see the different roles and the different responsibilities that the different types of um, developers and the two different types, types of operators have as well. All right, so I'm coming down to the end here, and I have one more story to share with you, and this one is my favorite. So we were part, I, I had the opportunity toward the end of my month, we were doing a, um, a uh, we were doing a full deployment. We were doing a new release deployment. And I said, ah, at morning stand-up, I said, I want to be on that team. So I sat down with my colleague, Kai, and I said to him, God, I hope something goes wrong. And he said, what? What are you saying? You can't possibly mean that. And I said, no, really, because I want to learn. And Jim's here. Jim's another one of my colleagues from uh, the Cloud Ops team. I'm like, I want to learn, and you learn a lot more when something goes wrong. And so we started our deployment, and I can tell you that we got a couple of hours into it, and I was like, this is so boring. We're like looking at things, and we're cleaning up a little things here, and we're doing administrative stuff, but we're, we're mainly watching it, but nothing's happening. And that's pretty typical for Cloud Foundry, is you do a deployment, and it's pretty dull. And then we started updating the DEAs. We're updating the runners, and we got a whole long way into updating the runners. And all of a sudden, one of the runners failed. And that should never happen. Thank you. That should never happen. If one of them works, that's the whole point of canary-style upgrades. If one of them works, if 10 of them work, the 11th one should work as well. So what on earth went wrong? So we started looking at things. We SSH'd into one of the runners that had worked fine, so runner number 94, let's say. And we SSH'd into runner number 96. And we, compared, we started looking at what's different. Because, oh, by the way, we looked in the logs, and the logs were telling us that we had a port conflict. So we went, logged into those boxes, and we started looking at what ports were bound to. And this is what we found. On the healthy DEA, we found that the Bosch agent was bound to port 15560, and the directory server was bound to port 34567. Very creative, 34567. On the unhealthy DEA, the Bosch agent was bound to 34567. And then the port binding failed at the directory server. So obviously, you can't have two different things bound to the same ports. So we were like, what? What is going on here? So to tell you, the Bosch agent is the first thing that starts. It's always the first thing that starts, and it starts listening right away. So the, the, the Bosch agent had already grabbed port 34567. And so we're looking at this, and we're saying, why is it bound to 15560 the first time and 34567 the next time? And once we found the port conflict, we went to our best source, and we went to talk to Dimitri. Dimitri is Bosch. And we, we got halfway into our sentence, and he said, ah, I know what the problem is. If I could do a Russian accent, I would do it, but I can't. So 
He said, I know what the problem is, and Dimitri always knows what the problem is. And he pointed us to something called ephemeral ports. There's a Wikipedia article, and ephemeral ports are basically, it's a range of ports that when you're dynamically assigning a port, when you're dynamically assigning a port, you can get it from that range safely. Punchline, you should never statically assign a port in this range. Well, that statically assigned port is in that range. So, but look how big the range is. It's like 30,000 big. So we have never hit this bug before because, we, um, because the range is so huge. So um, that's the, the lesson on ephemeral ports. And so I got my wish, something went wrong, and I learned something in the process. So just wrapping up in the last uh, 30 seconds here, Bosch is awesome. The experience was awesome. Um, there's all sorts of things here that are positive, immutable infrastructure, all of these great themes. And the final thing that I'll leave you with is that I have been blogging about the experience. So all three of those stories that I shared with you this morning, I've blogged about. And so you can find these all on our blog.pivotal.io, and you can read about them in a little slower pace, in a little bit more detail. So I thank you all for your attention, um, and I'll be around for all two days of the conference, so please seek me out if you have any questions.